chapter 17 to 40. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God, God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is, God's, is Christ's slave. You were bought as a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person is resp as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look, do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they, do, they, as if they did not. Those who, are, who, those who are happy as if they were, as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman of, or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honourably towards the virgin he is engaged to, and his passions are too strong, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has, who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he, does not, he, he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her, to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for reading so well for us. A couple of bits of a couple of bits of church family news just as we get started. You may be wondering where our curate uh, Ben Vane is this morning. Sadly, the family was struck down with a sickness bug overnight, so uh, do pray for them. 
And lots of you have been asking about Nancy, who uh, collapsed and was taken to hospital during the week at the women's dinner. Edward tells me, all is well, we think. And uh, Edward's very thankful for the way in which everyone rallied around on their Thursday evening. So thank you very much. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, do keep that passage open. And our subject this morning is one of absolute universal relevance to every single one of us. Uh, All of us will begin our adult life as single, and over 50% of us will end our adult life as single. This has something to say to every single one of us in the room. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about this whole theme of marriage, singleness, relationships. Uh, Two weeks ago, big, important foundational principles in place. Why did God invent marriage? An outward-looking project in the world. Not sex in the service of me, sex in the service of God. Last week, we thought about the overall storyline of the Bible and what that has to say about marriage. Now, this final week, we turn to this universally relevant subject, singleness and contentment. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you saw a popular movie with a contented single person? Uh, My guess is not very recently, actually, because the whole premise of the movie industry and the whole premise of the Valentine card industry is that singleness is to be avoided at all costs. And I wonder, is our church culture sometimes all that much different? When was the last time you heard a sermon promoting singleness? How many sermons have I given about marriage compared to those I've given about singleness over the years? Have you ever heard a married person talk about their spouse as their other half, or their better half, or their significant half? The implication being, of course, that without the spouse, I'm not really a real person. I'm only half a human being. So often, and I hesitate not, I haven't heard this about our church, but so often you hear of it's only the families and the couples who get invited round for lunch, uh, not the singles. Do you know, I even heard of a church 20s and 30s group called Pairs and Spares. (laughs) It's dreadful, isn't it? Well, our culture and even our church culture may disagree, but what I want us to do for 20 minutes this morning is to see that the Lord Jesus honours and esteems singleness very, very highly indeed. That's what we're doing. Uh, We're in 1 Corinthians 7. We're not going to go through every single one of those verses. We haven't got time. Three big implications, I think, from the passage. Here's point one. Uh, Point one, if you'd like to turn to the inside of the service sheet. Point one. Whatever your relationship status, it is okay with God. So just have a look down, would you, at 17 to 24, uh, verses 17 to 24. You thought you were coming to a talk on singleness, and then the passage is all about circumcision and slavery. What have they got to do with anything? And Paul says actually quite a lot, quite a lot, because whereas in our culture, the top thing that, you know, people think you need to know about someone is, are you in a relationship or not? Uh, I guess back in the day, the big sort of equivalent status question was whether or not you were a Jew or a Gentile. Were you slave? Were you free? Were you circumcised? Were you not circumcised? So imagine the, uh, the big party at the next door neighbour's house, uh, introduced to someone. Instead of the question being, what do you do? And are you in a relationship or not? I guess the question back then would have been, well, are you a Jewish person or not? Are you a slave? Are you free? And there's quite a lot of status anxiety about that kind of situation, isn't there? Who are the big people around here? What's the pecking order? Who's at the top of the pile? Who's at the bottom of the pile? Who really matters? And Paul cuts through all of that by saying, well, whatever your relationship status, it's okay with God, 
Just have a look at verse 18. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? Well, he shouldn't become uncircumcised. Not quite sure how that happens, but anyway. Um, Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Whatever your status, it's okay with God. Same point, verse 22. For the one who is a slave when called to faith is the Lord's free person. The one who is free when called is Christ's slave. God doesn't think that one status is more godly than the other. He doesn't think it's more spiritual to be married. He doesn't think it's more spiritual to be single. We live in a culture that thinks very differently, don't we? We live in a culture that says if you're not having sex, you're not a human being. That is what our culture says. We live in a culture where words like bachelor or spinster carry massively negative connotations. God disagrees. He doesn't think there is a right or wrong. Whatever your relationship status, it's okay with God. He doesn't think there is a right or wrong. And so the consistent advice all the way through the chapter is stay as you are. So heads down, have a look at verse 2, 7 verse 2. Are you married, 7 verse 2? Well, keep having sexual relations, says Paul. Verse 8, are you unmarried? Stay unmarried, verse 12. Are you married to someone who isn't a Christian, verse 12? Stay in that relationship. Verse 27, are you betrothed? Stay betrothed. Are you unattached? Verse 27, stay unattached. I guess verse 20 summarises all of it, doesn't it? Verse 20, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Whatever your relationship status, it's okay with God. Question is, is it okay with you? Let me just read a little extract from a single bloke talking about his experience of church family in this area. He says this, and yet the evangelical church still manages to communicate that singleness is a bad thing. The result in my life has been long-term campaigns by well-intentioned friends to marry me off. They used wedding seating plans, paired me off with suitable women at church to run things, made subtle suggestions, and then berated me for my lack of cooperation with their carefully laid plans. All of this was at best embarrassing and sometimes painful for me and the victims of their schemes. Uh, Would it be possible to stop thinking of singleness as second best? Uh, Would it be possible to have a category for people like Ed there who are actually happy to be single? Uh, Would it be possible for parents like me to stop assuming that necessarily the best thing for my children is for them to get married? Because that is exactly what Paul is saying here. Each of us should look at the situation that we're in and be content with what we've been given. If we have the choice between learning contentment and pairing off, Paul says actually it's better to choose the former option. God's aim is not to change our relational status. He's okay with whatever status we're at. God's aim is to change us to make us content in Christ. So point one, whatever your status, it really is okay with God. Here's point two, reasons why it's okay to be single. Let me read from verse 32. Uh, I'd like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. 
But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to, dis- not to restrict you, this is about freedom, not to restrict you, but that you may be live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now I guess there are lots of Christians, many Christians, who would describe themselves as unhappily single. Um, every wedding invitation feels like salt in the wounds. Friends are having a second or third child before we've even met someone. Vacations are hard, aren't they? Who do you go on holiday with? Buying the first house can seem less exciting. Even church can be awkward. I think it's fair to say that for most people, not getting married will will be tough. Not being able to satisfy the longings for home and family, uh, for sex. But do you see Paul's point here? His point is that marriage is tough too. Can you see that? I've not been in ministry that long, relatively, but already I have witnessed and been part of, well, seen lots of marriages that are really hard. People who struggle to get on with one another. Family life, the pressures of it. Just the heartache of seeing children grow up to reject the Lord. And the danger is, rather than comparing marriage and singleness on equal terms, what we do is we compare the upsides of marriage with the downsides of singleness. But Paul is saying here, when you make a fair comparison, when you weigh up all the pros and cons, well, he's saying actually singleness has lots of advantages. So married people, let me ask you, how easy do you find it in the midst of busy family life and juggling the schedules of four, five, six people in your house to find time every day to be alone with the Lord? How easy do you find it to drop everything in the midst of the crisis to go and be with the friend? How easy do you find it when the friend goes into hospital to have the baby to drop everything to go and look after the older sibling at home in bed? How easy do you find it to get to the church prayer meeting when you've got children at home? Uh, Can I say, as a father with three young children, I find those things incredibly hard. And I'm the vicar. (laughs) And church history would agree, because most of the big steps forward in world evangelisation have been taken by single people. So, uh, anyone know who these people are on the screen? Anyone know? A uh, person on the left, David Brainard, his ministry to Native uh, Indians in America, the Native Americans. person on the right, Gladys Aylwood, who, uh, whose pioneering work in, in China really opened up China for the gospel. And what we're saying is those people probably wouldn't have been able to do what they did for the Lord had they um, had family responsibilities. Now, personally speaking, I owe a huge amount to two guys who devoted huge amount of times to me at significant moments in my Christian life and they were only able to do that because they didn't have family responsibilities. The world champions the single life because of all that you can do for yourself. Stay in bed till lunchtime. Uh, Binge on Netflix. The Bible champions the single life because of all that you can do for the Lord. A greater capacity for friendship. Freedom to be flexible, drop everything in the midst of the crisis. No coincidence, actually, over the years the church has been hugely reliant on single people. Uh, I don't want to sound like a smug, um, patronising married, but single people, can I thank you so much for all that you do to use your singleness to serve the Lord here. The church has been so reliant on single people. And then, of course, there is Jesus. The most fulfilled and complete human being who ever lived was single. And so if we're saying that romantic attachment is necessary to live a complete, whole, fulfilled human life, uh, what are we saying about Jesus? Well, that he is subhuman. Uh, The Apostle John had a word for people who denied that Jesus came in the flesh. 
people who denied that he was a real human being. Uh, you can look it up later, it's not a nice word. But it's what we're implying. If we say that romantic attachment is necessary to a fulfilling, happy human life. So the point here is not that marriage is good, but if it doesn't work out for you, you know, this is how to make the best of it. Plan A's failed, plan B has some upsides. That's not the point. Marriage is good, marriage is the norm, marriage is the path that most people would choose, I think. But that doesn't necessarily make it the easy option or the right option. Perhaps the other big reason why it's okay to be single is there in 25 to 31, if you have a look down. Uh, Do you see that he talks about the present crisis in verse 26? which has less to do with something specific going on in Corinth. There's there's just no sign of a crisis anywhere in this letter. In fact, in the next chapter, he's going to be raising money for somewhere else in the world where there is a crisis going on. Much more to do, actually, with verses 29 and 31. More to do with the fact that we are on the age of the world to come. So verse 29, have a look down. Verse 29, do you have a wife? Live as if you don't have a wife. Verse 30, are you you mourning? Verse 30. Well, live as those who are not mourning. Verse 30, are you happy? Live as someone who isn't happy. Verse 30 again, are you going shopping? Verse 30. Buy something as if you don't own it. Now, obviously, he's not speaking literally. He's not speaking literally. But the point is, the clock is ticking. Everything has a sell by date. Everything is temporary. And so Paul says that people who follow Jesus will make bonkers, crazy, mad decisions because we belong to somewhere else. How bizarre that someone would choose to be single. How weird. How strange. But if you believe that this world is passing away, and if you believe there is a future wedding day, if you believe in the end that no one will miss out, well then maybe you can imagine someone making that kind of decision. I love going to Christian weddings, as I said last week. Uh, I love going to Christian weddings. But I think I've been to far too many weddings where people say something of their spouse that they really only should be able to say about Jesus. If we think that marriage is going to make us whole, complete, fulfilled, we are mistaking the model, human marriage, for the reality. The eternal marriage between Jesus and the church. Singleness is temporary. Even marriage now is temporary. Jesus is the main prize. So point one, whatever your relational status, it's okay with the Lord. He's okay with that. Point two, reasons why it's okay to be single. And then really quickly, as we finish, really quickly, point three, you're free. The chapter ends with frustration, doesn't it? We love rules. We love commands. And so we read this chapter and we think, Paul, just tell me what to do. Give me some advice. Tell me what to do. Is it better to be single? Is it better to be married? Just tell me, Paul. Just tell me. But Paul does the opposite. Do you see what he says, verse 35? I am not saying this to restrict you. Freedom. And so, verse 36, the one who gets married, you've done the right thing. Verse 37, the one who doesn't get married, you've done the right thing too. You want rules, don't you? You want commands. Most of us live our Christian life by rules. But the New Testament gives us freedom. In fact, it gives you far more freedom than you actually want. It really does. Someone once said, there's only one bit of careers advice in the Bible. Uh, Don't be a thief. Do anything else. 
And, and there's some truth in that, isn't there? And the same is true here when it comes to marriage and singleness. Just because Paul seems to be recommending singleness doesn't mean it's the best option, necessarily the more godly option, the more spiritual option. Whatever your relationship status, it's okay with the Lord. Maybe then you find yourself single and it's not how you hoped life would turn out. Maybe the Lord and his, his goodness hasn't given you the opportunity to get married. Perhaps you once were married, but now you find yourself uh, divorced, uh, bereaved. All of us will begin our adult life as singles. Over 50% of us will end our adult life as single. And Paul says it's a high calling. Marriage is good. Marriage is the norm. Marriage is the path that most people will choose. But it's a wonderful thing to be single for the Lord's sake. God esteems and honours singleness very, very highly indeed. Question is really, do we? Or do we think Jesus has got it wrong? Let's pray as we finish. Going to have a moment of quiet to uh, reflect on what God has said to us, and then Sarah Francis is going to come and lead us in prayer in a moment's time.